Well, Merry Christmas. Welcome to our annual Christmas Eve service. We're so glad that you're here. We begin by singing a wonderful Christmas carol together, Joy to the World. Stand with me as we lift our voices in song, Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of Thank you. You may be seated. Good evening. I'm Dave, and this is my wife, Diane, and we are privileged to serve this church. The story of Jesus Christ does not begin in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is the focus of the whole Bible, which means that the Old Testament is ultimately about Jesus, too. There are many Old Testament texts that remind us of the anticipation that the people of God experienced as they waited the coming Messiah. For instance, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise, bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This promise speaks of the coming offspring of a woman that would ultimately crush the head of Satan. And in Genesis 49, 10, the Lord promises, The sepulcher shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This passage narrows the promise to a coming ruler from the family of Judah, one of Jacob's sons. God guarantees David in 2 Samuel 7, 12, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body and will establish his kingdom. He continues in verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God promises that the coming Messiah would be a king from the line of David, and he would reign forever. The prophet Isaiah perhaps provides us with the clearest promise about the coming Savior. He says in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The coming Messiah would be born of a virgin, and he would not just be any man. He would be the God. He would be God, and he would live among us. The prophet Micah pr prophesied about the location of the Messiah's birth in Micah 5, 2. But you, O Bethlehem, 
who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. The Messiah King would, or would not arrive in a kingly mansion in Jerusalem, but he would arrive in the small town of Bethlehem. Some days God's children waited patiently. Some days they waited with tears and frustration. Some days they wondered if God had forgotten his promise. But God continued to remind them of his promises over and over again as his children waited. And one day, when no one was expecting it, God the Son would come down to the earth and take on human flesh. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. The long-expected Messiah was coming into the world as a baby, and he would be Emmanuel, God with us. Please join me in prayer. O kind Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, as we have been reminded through this scripture, Lord, that you have many promises. And Lord, that you have kept every promise. And Lord, we thank you so much for the promise that we share, the gift of Jesus Christ this evening. We celebrate the birth. But Lord, we thank you for that promise that, Lord, he was born of a virgin. Lord, he went to a place called Calvary and he paid for our sins. He was buried and arose again. And, Lord, that he defeated sin on the cross and death out of the grave. And, Father, this night, Lord, we thank you for the great promise that you have promised. That if we, as individuals, that we would see that this gift is the gift of salvation. That, Lord, we could ask that you would forgive us of our sin. And, Lord, that we, through faith, would accept this great gift. And, Lord, is my prayer that if anyone here this evening, that, Lord, that they have not received the gift through faith, that, Lord, that they would in this Christmas season, that, Lord, that they would do that. And, Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We continue now in worship as we continue with our Christmas carols, Angels We Have Heard on High. Stand with me as we sing, and as we do, the children can make their way to the steps for the Christmas story. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly seen o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. see me down there? Can y'all hear me? Here, why don't y'all come move right down here in the front so y'all can all see me and I can look at you. All right, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. 
It's good to see you this afternoon. I know y'all are all very excited that it's Christmas Eve, right? I am too, and I have lots of Christmas Eve traditions um, with my family from a little girl and all the way up to now. And one of my favorite things to do on Christmas Eve is to sit right here on these steps with you and tell you a story from the Bible. And that's what we're going to do right now. Now, you have to listen closely to this story because it might not seem like a Christmas story at the beginning, but I promise you there is an exciting twist and connection to Jesus. The story tonight comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Joshua, and it's about a lady named Rahab. And Rahab did not have a great reputation around town. Um, she thought things, she said things, and she did things that went against God. And actually, in the town of Jericho, where Rahab lived, most of the people didn't worship the one true God. In fact, the people had built big walls around their town so that nobody could get in. But what do we know about God? Nothing can stop God's perfect plan. And it didn't stop him this time either. So we also know, if we back up just a little bit, we know that God had promised his people, the Israelites, that they would live one day in the town of Jericho. And at this point in the Bible, the Israelites were outside the town of Jericho, and their leader sent two spies into Jericho to kind of scout it out before they went in to take over the city. And those spies were to report back and let their leader know what was going on. So when the spies got into Jericho, they met Rahab. And Rahab let them stay at her house. And while they were there at Rahab's house, the king of Jericho heard that they were there, and he got really angry that there were Israelite spies in his city. So he sent his soldiers out to capture the Israelite spies, and they rushed to Rahab's house. But Rahab did something very unexpected, and she hid the Israelite men of God up on her roof underneath some straw, and they were safe there. And when the soldiers had gone, Rahab went up to the roof. And I'm going to read from Joshua chapter 2 what happened next. Before the men fell asleep, Rahab went on the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. I have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now, this probably kind of shocked those Israelite spies because they didn't realize that Rahab worshipped the one true God. Because remember, she was in Jericho where the people didn't, didn't worship the one real God. But something had happened in Rahab's heart. God had changed her heart. Now, those spies, even though they were pretty shocked, they listened to Rahab as she begged them to help her save her family when the Israelites came in and took over the city. She said, since I have helped you, could you please help me save my family? And they said, yes, we will. And when they left, Rahab actually let them climb out. Imagine if this were a long red rope. Rahab hung that out her window, and she let the soldiers go down that rope and escape out of the back of the city. But before they left, they told her, they said, when we come back in and we take over the city, you throw this rope back out, and when we see it, you will be saved. And we won't come in, and we won't take your mom and your dad and your brothers and sisters. And that's exactly what happened when God told the Israelites it was time and the walls of Jericho came down and the Israelite soldiers went in, Rahab put her red rope out of the window and her family was saved. But that's not the end of Rahab's story. And this is where it gets really exciting um, for Miss Julie. Rahab actually went on to live with the Israelites 
as, and she was a foreigner, but remember she trusted God now. Not only did Rahab live with the Israelites, she married a prince of one of the Judean tribes and Rahab became a princess. And Rahab and her husband had a baby boy named Boaz. And does anybody happen to know who Boaz married? Does anybody know? What do you think, Molly? Boaz married a lady named Ruth, who was also a foreigner, but trusted God with all of her heart. Then Boaz and Ruth had a grandson named Jesse. And Jesse had a son who was a shepherd boy named David. And David became a great king of the Israelite people and a man after God's own heart. Now, isn't it kind of strange that God would choose a lady like Rahab who started out doing very bad things to be a part of David's family? What's even more incredible with this story is that hundreds of years later, another king would come from Rahab and David's family. But this king would be the most perfect king ever. It's Jesus. That's right, Zane. Jesus, God in flesh, came as a baby, God with us. And he grew up, and Jesus never thought, said, or did anything that went against God. But when he grew up, he died on a cross for us and for our sins. Can you believe, again, that God would choose a sinful foreign life? lady not like Rahab and all of the bad things that she did to be part of Jesus's family and that's exactly what he does for us as well Rahab expressed her belief in the one true God she hung that red rope out of her window and she was saved from death and she became a princess in God's family when Jesus was nailed on that cross the blood flowing from his hands and his feet hung for all of the people who believed in him that they could be saved. When we do that, when we express our faith in Jesus, God takes us from a person who thinks, does, and says things wrong, and he adopts us into his family, and we become princesses, and princes of the one true king, just like Rahab did. If you look around you tonight, there are red ribbons all over the place in the Christmas decorations. There's some girls up here that have beautiful red ribbons in their hair. We tie red ribbons on packages. When y'all see those this Christmas season, let it remind you of that wonderful story of Rahab and how she trusted God and when she did, he rescued her and her family and how he, God also sent Jesus as the rescuer to rescue you. We have tonight for you, when you go, as you go back to your seat, we have a red rope bracelet for you to wear around your wrist to remind you of this story as well. And just remember that Christmas, there is no better time than Christmas to trust the gift of Jesus. Amen. We continue now in that same spirit as we sing together, Away in a Manger. Stand with me as we sing, Away in a Manger.
may be seated. When Mary heard that she would soon give birth to the Messiah, this is the song that she sang in praise to God. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Oh, the mercy our God has shown to those who sit in death's shadow. Sun on high, pierce the night, born was the cornerstone. Unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born. He who is mighty has done a great thing, taken on flesh, conquered death's sting, shattered the darkness and lifted our shame. Holy is his name. Freedom, our Savior, one. The yoke of sin has been broken. Once a slave, now by grace, no more condemnation. Unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born. He who is mighty has done. Destiny shattered the darkness and lifted our shame. Holy is his name. Holy is his name. Now my soul magnifies the Lord. I rejoice in the God who saves. I will trust his unfair. Merry Christmas. It's so good to see all of you here tonight. For those I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Peyton and I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Prattville. And we're so delighted to be able to worship Jesus and to celebrate Christmas Eve with you all tonight. Now, I love Christmas and I'm, I'm guessing and assuming that you do too, hence why you're here tonight. And I know that when we think about Christmas, we also we often think about like our favorite movies that we watch at Christmas or or our favorite songs that we sing at Christmas or or maybe our favorite food that we eat at Christmas. But over the the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to think how would I kind of summarize and put into one word all that Christmas is? 
Like if you were asked to, to play the word association game and, and you were only given one word to, to kind of put Christmas into, what's the word that you would choose? Well, uh, maybe you would choose ornament because you would think about all of the, the wonderful Christmas decorations that we get to enjoy around the Christmas season. Uh, maybe you would think of like a lamp because you think of your, your favorite Christmas movie. Or maybe you would think of cookie because of your favorite Christmas food. Or maybe some of you are like super spiritual and you would think of manger. Because you would think, well, Christmas is, is all about the birth of Christ. And, and Christ was laid in a manger. And, and so that's what you would choose. Well, as I've thought about it over the last several weeks, I believe that, that if I really had to put Christmas into one word, I would choose the word waiting. Waiting. In fact, the, the Christmas season is all about waiting, expecting longing, hoping, as we remember how those in the Old Testament waited and expected and longed and hoped for the coming Messiah. In fact, I, I think the story of the Bible is the story of Christmas because I think the whole scriptures point us to this idea of waiting. You see, the Bible begins where every good story begins. It begins in the beginning. And in the beginning, we have this God who has no beginning, but in the beginning, he's creating all things for his glory and for his enjoyment. He created all that there is to, to glorify him. And on the sixth day of his creation, he created the man, Adam, and then out of the man, Adam, he created the woman, Eve. And he placed them in this beautiful, luscious, amazing garden. And he invited them to partake of, of whatever they wanted in this garden except for one tree. For in the day that they chose to disobey God's word and to, to eat of the fruit of the forbidden tree, they would experience evil. They themselves would experience brokenness. And they would invite a curse into God's good creation. Well, the slippery serpent, Satan himself, slithered into this garden. And the serpent tempted Eve to disobey the word of God. And she did, and she ate of the tree. But she didn't just eat of the tree and partake of it herself. She passed it on to her husband. And Adam as well ate and disobeyed the directive of God. And when they did, Adam and Eve in this luscious, good garden that God had given them to enjoy so that they could glorify him in that moment of their sin, of their rebellion, they invited darkness and brokenness and death and decay, and heartache, and a curse into God's good world. And of course, because God is, is just and right and, and holy and, and all things, God came to them in the garden and he removed them from this luscious garden. But he didn't just remove them. He told Adam, from now on, you're going to be removed from my provision as well. You're going to spend all your days working and working and working your fingers to the bone in order to provide for yourself and your family. And Eve didn't escape the consequences of this sinful act either. For she was told that the thing that, that ought to bring her joy in life, having the gift of children, was now to be a painful, hard, difficult task for her. Yet in the midst of all this brokenness, in the middle of the darkness that was covering the landscape because of sin, in the middle of God handing down consequences for the first man and the first woman's sin, God gave a promise. He looked at the serpent and he told the serpent in Genesis 3.15, that there was a day coming when the offspring of the woman, literally a child from the woman, would come and would crush the head of the serpent and would turn back the curse that this sinful act had brought into his creation. And from that moment, the people of the Bible waited. They expected 
They longed, they desired, they wanted the day when the Messiah would come, the the promised seed would come, the the offspring of the woman would come to crush the head of the evil one and and to roll back the darkness and the curse of sin on God's good creation. And all throughout the Old Testament, we read of these stories And in almost every story of the Bible, like in every good story that we read, there's a hero or a heroine, and and there's an evil one. And in every story, when the hero or the heroine wins victory for his people and, and, and crushes the head of the evil one, we think, maybe, maybe this is him. Maybe this is the one who's been promised from the beginning, but over and Over and over and over again, this hero proves himself to need salvation and redemption and delivery as well. Because every single hero that the Bible stories point to ultimately fail. They can't bring about the the turning back of darkness that that God had promised that one day his offspring would do. In fact, for the last several weeks, we as a church family have been journeying through the book of Ruth together. Uh, Ruth is a a small story in the the big story of the Bible. It's only four chapters. And in Ruth, we're introduced to this woman who, who lives and is from Moab, but journeys with her mother in law to the promised land, specifically to the town of Bethlehem. And there she's provided for and she's redeemed by a man named Boaz who becomes her husband. And in the moment where Ruth and Boaz make this this wonderful declaration that they're going to be married, there's people in the town of Bethlehem that even though the culture around them was dark and broken and by large had gone away from God, these people had been faithful. They were trusting and they were waiting. They knew that a Messiah was coming. They knew that the promised seed would arrive soon. And they were anticipating that it would happen. And in Ruth chapter 4, these people, as they begin to praise Boaz and Ruth and, and celebrate their upcoming wedding, they begin to cry out in Ruth chapter 4 verse 12, May your house be like the house of Perez. And Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Now this seems like a pretty random verse in the Bible to me. Perez seems like a pretty random guy to just be tossed out there. But what's happening here is incredibly significant in the story of the Bible. And the story of God bringing about the solution to our problem. And the story of the consolation and the conclusion of our longing and waiting. You see, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God promised that a rescuer would come from a woman. A child would be born. And so for generations upon generations, the people were hoping and they were waiting and they were longing. And with every hero, they were hoping that this would be the guy. Yet at the end of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 49, God came to a man named Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel. A man who had 12 sons. And God allowed Israel to pass a blessing, a a promise, a prophecy onto each of his sons. And when he got to his fourth son, Judah, God promised through Israel that this promised one, that this offspring from the woman's womb would not just come from, from somewhere out there, but would come specifically from the line and the ancestry, the descendant of Judah. And Judah's son was named Perez. And so the people wondered, is Perez the promised Messiah? But then Perez died. And now we fast forward back to the book of Ruth. And Boaz is in the line of Judah and Perez. And the people are crying out. 
They're trusting that God is going to keep his promise to send a deliverer, to, to send an offspring that will crush the head of the serpent. And they begin to cry out, oh dear God, would the deliverer, would the promised one not just come from a woman? Would the deliverer, would the promised one not just come from the line of Perez? But would the deliverer, would the promised one come from Boaz and Ruth? God gave Ruth a son. And they named him Obed. And the people wondered, could it be him? But then Obed died. But Obed had had a child. The problem is that child died as well. And that child had a child, but that child died as well. And the people went right back into the mode of expecting and waiting and longing for the day the one would come who would put an end to the curse. Uh, the day that, that the Messiah would come from the woman, from the line of Judah, from the line of Perez, from Ruth and Boaz, trusting that he would put an end to sin and death and rebellion and heartache and pain. And the people waited, and they longed, and they expected until the day when an angel named Gabriel was sent to a man named Joseph who happened to be born of a woman, happened to come from the family of Judah and Perez, and specifically Ruth and Boaz. And the angel Gabriel said, Joseph, don't you be afraid to marry your wife. Because she is going to have a baby who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. We waited and we anticipated and we expected with every story that we read throughout the Old Testament. Until finally the one who was promised to be born of a woman... The one who was promised from the line of Judah and Perez, the one who was promised specifically from the line of Ruth and Boaz came, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he was born in a town of Bethlehem as a long expected, the awaited one. He was placed in a manger so that eventually, just as he was placed in a wood trough as a baby, he would end his life on a piece of wood called a cross as well. You see, we often talk about that the meaning of Jesus is is really the, the reason for the season. But actually, the Bible says the reason for the season is not Jesus. The reason of the season is our sin and our darkness and our brokenness and our rebellion. Jesus came into the world as the solution to our waiting and our longing to put an end to our brokenness and our pain and our heartache. And the way that he did that was not simply by being born of a woman. He did that by living a perfect life and at the end of his life being nailed to a cross, not for sins he committed, for he committed none, but for our sins, dying in our place, taking our sins and our punishment upon himself, being placed in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day, coming out of the grave, defeating sin, conquering death, crushing the head of the serpent, so that all who will turn toward the Lord Jesus will be forgiven and redeemed and delivered. Now, a lot of people think, That's what Christmas is all about. And you would be half right. The thing is, is that after Jesus' resurrection, we're told that for about 40 or so days, he appeared to over 500 witnesses. Emmanuel, God with us, had come. He had been born. He had lived. He had died. He had rose again. But then he ascended and he went away from us. And though he sent us his spirit to dwell with inside of us, we wondered, how can Emmanuel leave us? How can the promised one that we've awaited all these years and longed for, how can he he go away? Which is why the Bible tells us that Christmas and Advent, which is simply a word that means arrival, is not simply about looking back and remembering that God kept his promise the first time in sending the Messiah. 
But as we remember that God kept his promise and sent the Messiah, it should build our trust and our faith and our belief and our reliance that God will keep his other promise to send Emmanuel back. And on that day, there will be not only forgiveness of sins, there will be no present of sin. And on that day, Christ, who was a baby, who's coming back as a king, will make all things new and all sad things will come untrue. See, on that day, we will see what Christmas is all about. First and foremost, remembering that those who waited and longed eventually received the conclusion of their hoping on that first Christmas night. But as we look back, it should grow our waiting and our expectation and our trust that he's going to keep good on his other promise to send Christ back again. And on that day, he will never leave us again. He will dwell with us as God with us for all eternity. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And every person that experiences a lonely Christmas this Christmas, this year, will never experience loneliness or heartache again because Christmas is about a king who came once but a king who was coming again and for those who have trusted in this king the one who was born to die and be resurrected so that we could be forgiven he is appearing is grand good news and on that day it will be a merry Christmas indeed let's pray together Father, so, so grateful that you are a faithful, righteous, good God. Lord, so, so thankful that you kept your promises. And Lord, not only did you send Jesus into the world to be born of a woman, but you sent Jesus into the world to die and to rescue us from our sins by defeating sin and death and his death and resurrection. But Lord, this Christmas season, as we celebrate and remember the, the fulfillment of the longing and waiting of those in the Old Testament, God, I pray that you would increase our faith and our trust and our reliance. That you will keep good on your promise to send Jesus back. And this time, he will never leave and the curse of sin will be rolled back for all eternity. God, may this be the Christmas that we remember and we long that we look back and we look forward. We pray this in the name of Jesus who came once and is coming again. Amen. And now we light the final Advent candle. <clears throat> God kept his promise. Jesus came just like God said that he would. But God's promises do not end there. Just like God's people waited with eager anticipation for Jesus to come and rescue them from their sins, we are waiting too, anticipating, waiting. This is what Advent is all about. God made us another promise. He promised that Jesus would return to earth. He has already saved us from our sins if we love and trust him. But when he comes the second time, he will save us from all the brokenness that sin has caused in this world. Luke's gospel gives us a picture of what is yet to come. He records the words of Jesus in Luke 21, 27 through 28, when Jesus said, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. In the last book of the Bible, Jesus gives us a vision to one of his disciples, John. Jesus said, I'm going to show you a secret, John, about when I come back. Write down what you see so God's children can read it and wait with happy excitement. I'm on my way. I'll be there soon. Just like before, God has given us hints and clues about how and when Jesus will return. And just like before, we wait. Sometimes we wait patiently. Sometimes we wait with tears and frustration because we cannot wait to live in a world without any sin. Sometimes we forget and wonder if Jesus really will come back. 
But God is faithful even when we are faithless, and Jesus will return. This time, Jesus will not come in the middle of the night as a baby. He will not be weak and helpless. The Bible tells us that when Jesus comes back, he will ride out of the sky on a horse carrying a sword. He will do battle with Satan, and he will win. Our king is coming back. We live between the two advents, the two comings of Jesus the Messiah. We live between Jesus' first arrival as a baby and his second arrival as a warrior king. While we wait, we wait with hope. We live lives of joy, peace, and compassion. We strive to be more like Jesus, every day putting sin to death. And we tell others that Jesus came to save sinners in hope that they will love and trust in him too. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when, but we know he's coming soon. So be ready. Soon we will worship our king as he deserves forever. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we worship you because you were obedient to your Father's plan to come into this broken world and to take our place, dying as a sacrifice for us on the cross. And in your resurrection, we know that you proved your power is greater than sin and death. And so, Lord Jesus, we know that you are returning and you are returning in power. And Jesus, we ask you that while we wait for your return, that those in this room and around our world who are experiencing pain and heartache, all of us who face the consequences of brokenness and a broken world, Lord, we pray that we would have the hope that you bring. Jesus, we pray that those who know you would be faithful to share the reason for the hope that we have and that we would proclaim that, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through you. And, Lord, we pray that while we wait, your presence, your Holy Spirit in our lives would give us the power to carry out your purpose of sharing the good news of Jesus with this world. Help us be peacemakers. Help us be those that would proclaim joy and the hope of Jesus. And Lord, while we wait, remind us that you will never leave us or forsake us. And that soon, very soon, you are returning. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let's all stand and sing together.
Jesus, born to set thy people free from my fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people Did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This was he of whom John cried out, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, no one has ever seen God. The only God, Jesus Christ, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known to us. This is God's word.
Christmas is ultimately about the king who came once and is coming again. Merry Christmas.